Hello, you're listening to Search for Truth, your Bible teaching program with Brian Johnston. Thanks for tuning in. Brian, our Bible teacher, is looking into how the first disciples organized their church life and where they found their scriptural blueprint for church operation. It has a scriptural basis and the word script is used as an acronym to elaborate on the different fundamentals of church life. Today, Brian comes to the fourth and fifth letters of script, which are I and P, which stand for integrated people. So Brian will now expand on that and explain how the scriptures identify the first New Testament churches as a unified and cohesive group of disciples together in service for God. So here's Brian. Thanks, John. If we stand back, we see that overall in the New Testament, the churches of God in the first century were all integrated into one interdependent community of churches, and they were not individually independent. There have been periods of more modern church history when local churches insisted on their independence, and when difficulties arose, since all assemblies acted independently of each other, there was never any way of ensuring consistency. This was at times the sad result of not working to the detailed scriptural pattern, as that provided a workable solution to these vexing problems. Let's then continue to share the script, as we've been calling it, that is the scriptural pattern in five of its essentials. And as spelt out by the letters of the word script, Let's remind ourselves of what they stand for, and indeed, let's check them independently against our own reading of the Bible. We start with S. In any one town, there was one single church, regardless of how many companies it was comprised of. S is for single. C. The Lord's table was closed to all but baptised and added believers, with addition to one local church, meaning addition to all. C is for closed. R. The rule of overseers was recognised in each of these churches, with these men acting together in matters affecting the doctrine and practice of all the churches. R is for rulers. Then taking I and P together, IP, the churches were all integrated people in one interdependent community of churches and not independent, neither were they dependent, but IP stands for integrated people. And finally, T, the temple or house of God was comprised of all those churches unitedly together in service. T is for temple. Now, let's deal with the fourth item in that list. In other words, IP stands for integrated people. Suppose someone was to ask, where in the Bible do we get the idea that each local church should be interdependent with other local churches in an overall community or fellowship. He or she might add, what's wrong with different local churches being autonomous or independent to the extent of making their own decisions about fundamental teaching? Let me try to say something about this based on the position we find in the New Testament. But before we begin, I think we'd want to clarify, of course, that we would doubtless all agree that local elders have to be responsible for all the local operational matters belonging to their church. Beyond that, I wonder if you'd bear with me dealing with this under three headings, taking them in turn as they relate to theological, historical and practical points of view. First, there's a theological basis that God's people should be an integrated people. This tracks all the way back to the bedrock truth of what's known in the New Testament as the church that is Christ's body. The Apostle Paul refers to this church by that name at the end of his first chapter when writing to the Ephesians. It's the same church Christ spoke of when he said, I will build my church in Matthew chapter 16. And it's the church into which every single true believer in Christ is incorporated by being baptised in the Holy Spirit when they first believe in Christ for salvation. We say again that at the end of the first chapter of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul calls it the church 
which is his, that is, Christ's body. All believers, whether dead or alive, are members of this church and can never be dismembered from it. If we were to confine ourselves to the present day, then what we are saying is that all true living believers automatically and unconditionally belong to it, so that we may call it, in that sense, the universal church. This universal church truth that's taught plainly in Scripture, being the truth of the church, the body, is a strong background indicator that argues at the local church level for a coordinated interchurch or connectional approach between local churches. And that's because each local testimony is a characteristic sample of the whole body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. The implications of this body teaching reaches down to all believers as individuals. For each and every believer has a spiritual gift. The Apostle Paul, in fact, takes up the metaphor of the human body when he deals with this in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, in the same way that our human body has different members with complementary functions, for example, think of the eye, the ear, the nose, the hand and the foot. Obviously, these all have different roles to play in serving our whole human body. His point is that we as believers need one another in the same way. Because not everyone is equipped as a teacher, not everyone is equipped as an evangelist or as an administrator. Now, if the reality of teaching to do with the body of Christ reaches down to the individual level of each believer, then it must surely apply at the intermediate local church level. The result of autonomy or independence between local churches sooner or later would be that those individual local churches would act in opposing ways to each other in teaching and practice. And that would be a real denial of the background church the body truth, which these very same local churches are designed to express in visible terms. When the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesian Christians, he refers, as we say, to the church the body of Christ, but he does it in two ways or two senses. First, he describes it as it appears before God, or as we might say, in its ultimate sense. And in that sense, he talks of it being perfect without defect. On the other hand, Paul also deals very much with its representation on earth, in the here and now. And that's where his addressing of these New Testament churches, such as the Church of God at Ephesus, comes in. Paul always stressed they should all have one teaching and one practice. For example, check out 1 Corinthians 4 and 17 or chapter 7 and verse 17. Otherwise, if they had different practices and different teachings, they would be doing a rather poor job of showcasing the universal church. Now, second, there's the historical basis that God's people should be an integrated people. As we said at the start of this study, the overall picture at the topmost level of exposition, the New Testament picture, that emerges directly from a plain reading of the history book of the Acts of the Apostles, and it's that of born-again believers, baptised in water by immersion, added to local Church of God fellowship, all within an overall community, which is known as the Holy Nation, or the Kingdom of God, or the Holy Priesthood, or the Spiritual House. And that overall community everywhere remained loyal to a single set of doctrines that we're calling the biblical pattern, or its recognised standard of teaching. It was this that served as the basis for them to be maintained in unity under a fellowship of elders, while existing in separation from the world and from ecclesiastical error. Think again of the group names that we've just used there. They all come directly from the pages of our Bible. Remember them? Group names or nouns such as kingdom, priesthood, and nation. How can the use of these collective nouns and the clear vision of togetherness that surrounds them, how can that support the idea of locally autonomous churches? So that's the lesson from history. Third, there's the practical basis that God's people should act as an integrated people. 
You see, the first century local churches of God were united in practice by letters of commendation to Corinthians 3.1 and the sending of relief supplies to each other. In this context, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is particularly revealing in that it demonstrates the interdependence that existed among and between the local churches mentioned on the pages of our Bibles. When it talks there in 2 Corinthians 8 about among the churches, all the churches, by the churches, off the churches, and before the churches. These churches that were so clearly linked in the New Testament didn't resolve conflict and disputes on an autonomous basis. In Acts chapter 15, a significant problem that arose was not resolved in isolation at that locality alone, which is what we would have expected to happen on the basis of the autonomous local church model. And it's not Paul's appeal to the local church at Corinth to come into line with the uniform practice of churches of God everywhere. And you get that appeal in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16. That appeal for the local church at Corinth to come into line with the uniform practice of churches of God everywhere else is quite devastating to any autonomous policy, is it not? The excommunicated brother at Corinth could have sailed across the Aegean Sea to be received into church fellowship at Ephesus if there was nothing more than local autonomy in each place. The follow-up teaching regarding the listing of excommunicable sins and disinheritance from the overall kingdom in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 further shows how unworkable this would have been if it had been the case that, for example, the brother we read about who was disfellowshipped at Corinth in chapter 5 had been able to go down the road to Cancrea and break bread with the disciples there. If the churches in the first century had not been connectional in their operation, then biblical discipline would have been very easy to sidestep and avoid. For biblical discipline to be a workable proposition, there's got to be coordination between elders in every church. And if you don't have that, then biblical discipline is simply not workable. And at times in history, that has sadly proved to be the case. And so, summing up, the IP in our use of the word script stands for integrated people as we try to communicate something of the biblical New Testament pattern. Lord Jesus, I hope you've enjoyed today's study, and if you have a question about any of the talks in this series, then do write in to brian at sft at churchesofgod.info and have a discussion with Brian. The transcript book of all the talks in this series would also be helpful for you if you want to pursue further study. Just ask for the title, A Good Place to Begin, and you can use email or the post and here's our address. Search for Truth, Hayes Press, The Barn, Flaxlands, Royal Wootton Bassett, Swindon, SN48DY, UK. Our email address is sft at churchesofgod.info. I'd be delighted if you join me again next time for our final Bible study in this series. The last letter in script is T, and we'll learn next week what it stands for. But for now, it's goodbye and very best wishes from our Bible teacher, Brian, our producer, David, our singers, and me, John. So see you again soon. And in the meantime, we wish you God's richest blessings. Oh, teach us, Lord.